It has a message. God bless you for being a listener. Well, I love you, Lord. I love you. I know you know that is my heart. I have a need, dear Lord, to pay the toll for the books that need to get done, that are behind. Then the Lord said to me, something will open. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, son. Then the Lord said to me, just keep on going. Just keep on going, son. Just keep on going. Then the Lord said to me, just keep on going. Don't look back. Just keep on going. Then the Lord, Lord said to me, don't look back. Just keep on going. on going.
Hello, hello, everybody, and here we are. Well, this is number 23, Escape from Exodus. And um, <clears throat> today, it's a journey. And I want to take you on this journey. And uh, it's got some side events. And we, we've got to cover them. And I need to start off on this April 3rd Sunday and um, read the manifest broadcast an announcement that we mailed out because it has valuable information in it. <clears throat> so um, let's do it. Using invisible trackways in a super kind of spiritual space that has no cognizance, no cognizance to most human beings, exists main life, M-A-I-N, life whose credits of existing, whose vestries once known tell ancient histories of implicit realities, which have scopes that reach even beyond the stars. Now, is that just a bunch of talk, or is that real, ladies and gentlemen? It is very real. And that spiritual space that it's talking about is the abode space that every person who is born into the world has in them. For instance, in the first chapter of the book of St. John, it says that every person that's born into the world is born in the light. They have this light in them. And that light is two things. <clears throat> it is, number one, the spirit. And number two, the kingdom of God that is in that spirit. And that's a beautiful thing. So beautiful. Now, <clears throat> trackways like circuits a super kind of spiritual space not cognizant to most people in the science world they just shear away from the idea of using the term spirit unless they might happen to be naming a space probe they just shear away by sheer, S-H-E-E-R, just strip down every possible need to ever use the word spirit. And in the religious world, there's a certain amount of non-conduction. The conductors that are chosen to be the ministries and to lead them in the song of truth seem to veer away from a lot that has to do about the Spirit, especially the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Holy Spirit is not our spirit, but it is the ghost of God who never comes in. We're talking about the ultimate invisible God who never comes into the physical world except by his, <clears throat> except by his Holy Ghost presence. And there needs to be credit given that this spirit within humans exists because there is the potential to know ancient histories of implicit realities which have scopes that reach beyond the stars. The Bible is explicit, and I've read several incidents of the Scripture to you in which it tells that there are things that belong to our glory, that belong to our reality, that existed before the foundations of this world. That's Bible, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to believe in the reality and in the deep, then that's the kind of things you need to believe. There is reality beyond the stars. There is a first domain, a heaven beyond and be above all the heavens, the heaven of heavens, heavens, capital H, of the heavens, small h, which can be anything from our sky, Genesis, the first chapter, called the firmament, firmament or can be spaces that belong to planets and stars and, and, and spaces that are just part of the the great uh, volume of what's called the universe. 
Well, we've got to deal with this main life called the spirit. And it is constantly dealing with opposite energies that confront the human body house because it has an investment in that human body house. That human body house is the vessel that the spirit is using for the journey of life to, to find its way back to its belonging, to find its way back to regeneration, to becoming who that spirit was before it fell into the body. There are messages everywhere, signs of the time everywhere. It's called manifotus. In nature, there are messages. In the sky, on the earth, in the cosmos, there are messages. In figures that are lines and trackways and triangles and points that use vivid expressions describing some of these geometries of, the, of nature and of the universe, there are messages. For instance, let's consider the triangle. That always has been a fascinating figure to me. The, the triangle, when you measure its internal angles, they add up to 180 degrees. In the full meaning of duality, 180 plus 180, it equals 360 degrees. How do you get this duality? Well, every wave has an up and a down. Every point that is of one level has a point of an opposite level. For the good, there is the bad. For the positive, there is the negative. And that is the way it exists in this cosmic place called the universe. And it has a lot to do with the reality even of the spirit world to a certain extent, except that there is a beholden way that the spirit world deals with it that the physical world cannot. So then we have the 180 degrees and then we have the opposite, because everything has an opposite, which gives it another, <clears throat> another 180 degrees. And you add those together, you get 360 degrees, which equals a circle and a potential revelation of many, many things. Consequently, the knowledge of a triangle piece of mentality and its potential representations via a duality even allows intrusion into uncommon space. In Psalms 19 of the Bible, it says, the line goes out into all existence, and there exists there exist no place no, nor language that this line does not have a presence. It is both manifold and manifest of importance to the fundamental knowledge about physical and spiritual life that the insight about the spirit which each person possesses be revealed in visible circuits, some lost, some waiting to be found, some waiting for the fullness of time to be revealed, nevertheless are real in a deep sense, imagined and not imagined. The occurrences of vanishings via the often failure of maintaining a presence of mind called memories is a scary thing. Scary to persons whose attention spans and memories are subject to distractions and loss by brain information misplacement. The calling is to study to be approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. The calling is to wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They are in themselves escape roots out of the spiritual Egypt where the Bible says Jesus was crucified. Revelations 11.8 
Obviously, according to Revelations 11, 8, 8, there existed at the same time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, a dual location of the crucifixion. The Jerusalem physical area, of course, was where the Romans, Roman soldiers surrounded the cross and made sure that the cross of Jesus, the cross of the criminals, the other two men were secured and that there was no one around that could release them. And that was outside of Jerusalem, but in the Jerusalem area. But the Bible talks about another place that the crucifixion happened called spiritual Egypt. Revelation is 11.8. So then according to that, there existed at the same time in the crucifixion of Jesus in the Jerusalem outer area, a crucifixion in a spiritual sense in the spiritual Egypt area. Now perhaps you would think, well, okay, that's it. That's the limit. There's the duality, the two. But no, it doesn't end there. The skewed comprehension that exists out there in religion, in science, and in many different modes of mentality are created by incorrect definitions strung into the brains and causing mind wind-ups that are in reverse to the quality of real knowledge, wisdom, and peace within. There are deep meanings that the Bible possesses. Words like sila, S-E-L-A-H, or sometimes just S-E-L-A, and it is understood that the A-H is to be added. Words like Melchizedek, the Father's house, entanglement, photo translation, and yes, all those words can be shown to be in the descriptive titles of other words and are possessed in the word knowledge of the Bible. Also the Holy Ghost and many, many other words. Keep in mind, as I said, there are many things that exist by descriptions and definitions that are not valid. They're not valid because they are skewed as to the comprehension of reality, as to the comprehension of what is fact and what is revelation. As these incorrect definitions come under the manifest microscope, potentially devastating germs of false premises never seen before are suddenly revealed. I'm weary outside of the good and right suppositions, I'm weary of those incoherent theories upon which science and religion have built castles in the air that are made out of puffs of toxic man-made myths. On the Sela Trail is a path split off that touches the ladder lattice of Jacob's Ladder, Genesis 28, 12, and the Mahanaim, the duel of the armies of God, the duel camps, Genesis 32.2. Such are counterpart realms that can be used with ease by those who are taught how to use a simple order of conduction. As the physical world is moving exponentially in huge advances of discoveries and inventions, even more so, the spiritual counterworld is opening up awesome advanced advances in the spiritual Christian realms. So I bid you now, as I get into this teaching, into this message, come with me. Feel the pulse of the energy dots that hold the stories of the origins. Check out with me the pie of the circle. Triangulate with me in the 180 degrees of the duality of circles that quotum-wise equals nine gifts of the Spirit. And how do you get that? 
Well, you get it by counting number values. When you take the 360 and you do it horizontally as an addition, the 3 and the 6 equal 9. And we show how that in the circle of time, this refers to the nine gifts of the Spirit. So if you go backwards in time, the nine gifts of the spirits, of the Spirit equal a circle, a very divine circle. And within those nine gifts of the Spirit is the term of the name of one of the gifts called helps, H-E-L-P-S. And I assure you, this is a gift from the Spirit Gateway for flights to beautiful dimensions of truth beyond all imagination. Well, last week we talked about this duality. We talked about the covenants spoken about in Galatians. And I've had a question or two that's been uh, asked about that. So I felt for your nourishment and your information, it would be nothing less than wisdom to, um, to go back over uh, some of that wording. So we turn to the book of Galatians, G-A-L-A-T-I-A-N-S. And in the fourth chapter, it has some things to say. Verse 19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. That is so powerful. It's a miracle that the energy and the power of it could stay in the print of that sentence. I travail in birth again. How many times can you go through birthings? Many times. And those birthings are not imaginative. And those birthings have real substance. They are real entrances into divine pathways. And in those divine pathways, you have spiritual energy dot buttons that can be pressed that allow special energy to come into you that Christ has, in his great spiriting of creation, made available to those who will. I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Do you understand what that means? That's talking about pregnancy. That's talking about doing something in the spirit that causes the pregnancy of Christ to be born in a person, to be, to be embryonic, impanation placed. There's an embryonic impanation of Christ that can be formed in you. And Paul says, I'm travailing for this birth. I'm travailing for it. I desire to be present with you now. And so I can say that too. I desire to be present with you now in the clarity of understanding, in the clarity of knowledge in the clarity of the profound, manifest insight to what these things that are written by the Spirit by Paul really have significance of. Verse 22, Galatians 4. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now let's get this, because this is the, this is the answer to any paradox. This is the slate written on the rock of Selah that has written on it the duality. Abraham had two sons, not one son. He didn't throw one of the sons away. He dismissed them from each other because they both had different callings and different destinies. And it was very difficult for him to, to do that because he loved the first son that he sent away. He loved him very much. But he followed the will of God. Abraham had two sons 
the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Do we throw away the seed of Abraham because he spilled it or put it in a vessel called a bondwoman? In the reality of all realities, do we not understand the true message of Genesis and the true messages spoken of in, in Corinthians and other places of the Bible? For instance, in Romans, where it says that hath not the potter power over the clay? Romans 9, 21. Hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump to make one vessel into honor and another vessel into dishonor? Is that what happened there? It seems like it. But did that make the vessel that was of honor greater than the vessel that was not of honor? Sometimes the vessel of dishonor is just as important, if not more important, than the vessel of honor. Now, in your home, you might consider the toilet a vessel of dishonor. But let me assure you when, that when the dot comes down to the point, that vessel of dishonor can be more useful and more needed than a whole lot of other things that you could toss out. There's probably some chairs and some benches and some lamps and all kinds of other things that seem to be far more poignant, far more elaborate and more like vessels of honor. A place for the king to sit, or the queen to sit, or the person who thinks they're a king or a queen. But take out that vessel of dishonor, the toilet, and a lot of agony comes into play. No, be careful, I'm not calling people toilets. But I'm just trying to make an example so that you can understand. Verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known? Endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And that he might make known the, vessel, the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had before a pair, a, a, a four prepared unto, unto glory. Some of these vessels that are of dishonor were made vessels of dishonor so that in their own particular kind of way could be used as vessels of mercy attributed to the afore prepared mission of glory and revelation of glory. And so then finally in Romans here, verse 30, same chapter, chapter 9 of Romans. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have obtained to righteousness even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel followed after the law of righteousness and hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. I hope you get that. I hope that that sticks in your craw and it sort of grinds around on those rocks that are in there of the stones of the Word of God and makes it so it's digestible. Back to Galatians. For it is written, Abraham had two sons. Galatians 4.22. We've got the bond woman's son. We've got the son of the free woman. Verse 24. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. There's two. T double O. I want you to get that. T double O. Two covenants. The one, the one, now we're boiling it down, from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. Or in the Old Testament, Hagar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai. Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem which now is. Now there is the distinction then of the differentiation. The one speaks to another. Why does the one answer to the other? Because the other 
is all tied into the Abrahamic connection genetically. And, and, and so they answer to each other. So it answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Now here we got something interesting. We got the bondwoman who has this son. And let's talk about let's talk about something similar like Esau and Jacob. We're not particularly referring in this case that this bondwoman produced Esau, but we're saying they all belongs to the, that kind of a category. And we've got the, the bond woman that produces this son, and you've got the free woman. But in this case, the free woman, which is supposed to produce free sons, is in also in bondage. And we see it right here. This which answers to Jeru Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Now someone can apply that different ways, but I see it very interesting. So then what do they have to do to be able to show that we have a separated, distinctly two different kind of, of covenants? Well, they go to the same thing that I gave you earlier, where the crucifixion was in Jerusalem, but it was also spiritually in Egypt to fulfill that scripture says, I called my son out of Egypt. And so then we have tied in with the spiritual Egypt, the escape to be free, which is the birth of the free woman, children. And so even though at the time that a comparative of the covenants is made, we got those that were born of a bondwoman, we got those who became into bondage, but they were still saved by what? By the grace of the fact of the duality. And there is a double duality here, the duality of the two physical aspects and then add to that the two spiritual aspects. Each one then has a duality on top of being a duality and involved with the, the pair. So you have a foursome there, which gives you the four square. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. In the end, it's the mother of the Gentiles. It's the mother of the bondwoman. It's the mother of the free woman. And that is the revelation. And that is why there is this duality and there is this message and this beautiful, glorious thing, how that God's grace reaches out in this double covenant. Okay, I've got to keep rolling. So much for that. Let's go on. Now, in the duality, the minute we start talking about the duality, that opens a lot of pages. A lot of pages. Because there's so many things about the duality that is so very interesting. So very, very interesting. Let's look, for instance, at the idea that the Bible says in Psalms 29, 7, 9, um, that the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. That means one flame can be divided into two or more. And then what is the purpose of that dividing and, and the ultimate resolution of that? Verse 8. Now that's Psalms 29, 7, the first one. The Lord divideth the flame of fire. Now verse 8. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh, which is another name for Petra or Sila. Why does it shake it? Because it goes along with that, that uh, prophecy and, and descriptive aspect 
where there is this tree and there along, along comes this shaking to shake loose all of the fruit that is supposed to fall away and only the fruit that is the destined fruit is able to cling. And what is it trying to shake away? Well, Satan as well as Saint Lucifer Saint knows that, that the Petra had a sacred intent. It had a destiny. So what does it do? It gets its gods involved over there and gets those, all those different kinds of gods with all those different kinds of religions. Some of those concepts involve some very, very interesting things that have to do with, with planets and stars and messages that are very, very far out. And we're going to talk about that after a bit. And so it goes on in verse 9. Psalms 29, 9. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf. I, sometimes I want to laugh when I read that. Because this goes back to that verse that I read earlier about Paul travailing for the birth. Because what it's saying, the voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calf. Well, the calf is a really, really big thing in religion. Both on the spiritual side and on the, the non-spiritual side. And I sort of like the word hind for abbreviation of hind in. How that in some cases, people that are just so stubborn to live their natural, physical, sinful life are hind ends. That means that they put their butt first before they put their intelligence first. But God, nevertheless, has mercy, and he makes the hinds to calf. Well, that's not exactly what that meant, but it is a very good, um, <laughs> very good analogy in the sense of an, uh, a symbolic idea. So now, what is this whole thing about here, the voice of the flames? It's about the birthing. It's about the birthing. It's about the animal nature, but causing it to calf, to calf and to bring forth. It discovereth the forest, and in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. Ladies and gentlemen, the word of God is so beautiful, so sacred, so absolutely appealing to me, and I hope to you. Well, when we start talking about this duality, it does not stop. We talk about Kadesh, Barnea, which means holy. But it has been supposed from Numbers 13, 21, 26, and Numbers 20 and 1, that's Numbers 13, 21 through 26, or just 21 and 26, rather, and Numbers 20 and 1, that there are two places that have the name Kadesh. One in the wilderness of Paran, or Par Paran, and the other in, the, in that of Zin. But it's possible, they say, that there's only one place, but that Zin is but a part of, a great, of the great desert of Paran. But even to this day, they do not really know where Paran is. But this idea of the duality is powerful. Like we've shown from Deuteronomy 4, 48, Mount Zion, which is Hermon. And then there's a Mount Zion, which belongs in Jerusalem. Deuteronomy 4, 48. And what happens well, Romans 9.33 says, I, I, lay, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. So, you understand the stumbling stone certainly can be this idea of the duality. People just don't get that. They don't get the, the Gentiles. Like when Paul was given a ministry to the Gentiles, there was a lot of the Christians that came out of the Jewish sect that were just totally against it. They just didn't feel that the, the Gentiles had the right to have 
the, the gospel uh, preached to them. But they were wrong. Hebrews 12, 22 says, Come into Mount Zion. Revelations 14, 1 says, A lamb stood on Mount Zion. Zechariah 2, 7 said, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. And it just goes on and on. Joel 2, uh, Joel 3, 20 through 21 says, Jerusalem shall dwell from generation to generations. For I will cleanse their blood, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Now here's a prophecy that says that God is going to do genetic things. The genomes of people are going to be changed. Their blood are going to be cleansed. So we've even got the two rock experiences, the two Selah rock. Uh, we have in at Horeb where God spoke and said, Strike the rock twice, and there will come water out of it. So, so we get the number two. And what is the Lord trying to reveal about the, the dual covenant? Strike the rock twice, and the water will come out of it for the people that have no water and are thirsty. But in Kadesh, the Petrasila rock, God said, to do it a different way. He did not want the rock to be struck. He wanted to step up. I described a little of this to you last week. And he wanted it to speak because at that particular sila, that was known as the city of the dead. And he wanted to, to speak to the rock. And when he would speak to the rock without using the rod to strike it, the water would just come out. And you know, the Mary said to Jesus, Oh Lord, if thou had been here, if thou had been here, Lazarus would not have died. And he says, well, Lazarus will live again. Oh, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. I know that, Lord. And Jesus looked at her and said, I am, I am the resurrection. You know, we have to start to understand what the Bible is saying. The duality. There's two Mirabas that I just described. Two. Two different places, but both given the nickname of Mirabah because the Israelites committed the same kind of sin in both places. And the story goes on. Janet Lee at the organ.
Thank you, Janet Lee. I just love the finger touch you have. Just the right, right weight. Just the right accent. Oh, wow. Okay, and hello, everybody out there again. Let's just sort of finish up on this duality if we can. Because you see what happens as you get into all of these different different kinds of names, like you go into the Bible, and the Bible may have three or four or five different names that are from different languages, different cultures. And so they can mean the same place, but they can have a different sounding and, and have some different relevance of, of meaning. And there's things like Mount Sinai. You know, uh, it appears to be the title of one particular me, uh, peak uh, and not a, a, a range of mountains. Uh, Horeb, uh, and Sinai, however, are sometimes used synonymously uh, in the scriptures. And, uh, you know, it, it, it appears that uh, Sinai, in that sense, sometimes is a mountain in the wilderness, and other times Horeb seems to be a general designation of surrounding areas. And then even Rephidim to the northwest is referred to as being the region of Horeb. Read uh, Exodus 17, 1 through 8. And so we get all these different descriptions. And you might also check out reading Exodus 3, 1 through 6. And it's so important. And then we see, and I've read this to you before maybe a couple of times, but it's important, so I'll be going over because this revelation of Selah is quite a masterful insight. And um, this, uh, this Sela thing, uh, as I read before, but read again, Isaiah 16, 1 through 2, 16, 1 through 2, Isaiah, send lambs as tribute to the ruler of the land from Sela across the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Like fluttering birds pushed, pushed from the nest, so are the women of Moab and the fords of Arnon. You know, there's so much beautiful there. I mean, I could just expand these, you know, sin lambs. There, there is a, a, a lamb, uh, you know, significant there of representing Christ's ministry. And, and uh, sin the lambs, the, the, the representing the different uh, persons who are representing Christ uh, to, as, as tribute to the ruler of the land from Selah across the desert. Um, there's got to be a, a caravan of truth that crosses the desert plains, that comes to these monumental uh, spiritual uh, places that that uh, are etched in reality, and and have a message. Isaiah forty two ten through eleven. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let the people of Sela sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintop. Wow. And then. You know, uh, just getting into this whole thing and looking at this whole thing reminds us in Acts 17.23 when Paul went to Mars Hill at Athens and climbing up on Mars Hill in Athens, he saw this inscription, this monument, and it said, To the Unknown God. These people had the sense that they had many pluralities of gods and they just wondered if being there were so many if they might not have missed one. So just to not miss any of them, they said, okay, well, in case we've missed one of you out there, we don't want to make you angry. Here's a monument to you, but we don't know your name. So they called it to the unknown God. Today we have the unknown universe, uh, which is basically 96% uh, of, the, of the universe is unknown by the scientists, by the astro astronomers. And so they know 4%. And they're trying by that 4% to tell us what the whole universe is, and, and they can't do it. So in the Holy Manifest of the Invisible Bible, and we call the Bible sometimes the big part of what you're looking at and you're reading, tells about things that you are invisible, like earlier when I talked about you know, the invisible Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, uh, the invisible crucifixion, uh, the uh, Egyptian crucifixion, the spiritual crucifixion. So 
There needs to be always a search for the double image of the, that the Word of God reveals. Uh, like the word uh, in Genesis 32, 1 through 2, Mahanaim, meaning two camps of angels, a double image. Uh, in connection with Genesis uh, 31, 13, the God of Bethel, the Father's house, connected to Genesis 28, 12, 16, and 17, angels ascending and, and descending. The images all belong together. They're all part of a puzzle. They all need to be uh, reconciled as information, information, and one must reposition the emphasis of the shadows and the frame lines of the lesser image before the greater image can appear. For it is the double image of the Word of God that holds the total and, and combines all the lesser image uh, to make the Word of God first in its 30-fold revelation, then in its 60-fold revelation, and finally in its 100-fold revelation. <clears throat> so, there is written in the inner centrum, inner centrum of the book, which is a consistency of different parts and collectively belong to the invisible Bible, uh, which holds absent truth, lost truth, mistranslated texts, and many, many other awesome and incredible things that people need to be able to come into the comprehensive of because it's beyond the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. It's beyond that. And uh, the, um, the sinful actions of a Exodus people were all, all, many times wrapped around uh, because of their sins and because of their punishment and their judgment were wrapped around many of the golden revelations. And so you have to, you know, like when you're uh, looking for gold, uh, you, you, you have to pan it. And when you pan it, you have to sh shuttle out uh, the gravel and the worthless parts till you're just left with the good gold flecks. And that's what you have to do with the Word. Some say, you're trying to tell me that part of the Bible? Yes, I am. I'm trying to tell you that that's the way the Bible is written. It, it, has, it has things in it that tell about corrupt people, about sinful people, <clears throat> about evil spirits and evil people. And those things you, you are to know about, but they're not to become a part of what you are because they're a part of what God does not want you to become. And that's why he's advising you of it. So, when you pick up the letter of the law, that kills. So, you have to be careful that when you think you are being accurate and you think you are being precise and you think you are fulfilling uh, the, the, the knowledge of reading, that uh, you, you can be involved in, in what is, is death. The letter of the law kills. Uh, check it out, 2 Corinthians 3.6. Remember this, what you, what you will see is not the manifold blessings of God, but rather stories of human living in an earth world of lost memories. Compare Psalms uh, 88, 12 and John 4, 4, 5 and 26. We're living in an earth world where struggling mortals are on a journey in a land of temptation and curse, people seeking to find truth but whose only road map is looking through a glass darkly. Compare Hebrews 11, 13 through 14 and 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So we begin to see that the middle jams of the thought waves of reasoning must be abridged by accepting uh, a process of discovery uh, that belongs to the original expressed thoughts of God, which are higher than the mortals and higher than the mortal mind and must come into a person via the Spirit. We're going to talk a lot about the Spirit uh, after a bit because it's part of the, the Alpha Omega revelation and it is so important uh, to understand its connection to the opening of the seals of the, of the book of God and to the, uh, uh, the insight and understanding of the seven thunders and all of the things that are so absolute of the Holy Word and the miracles of God. It is a beautiful time uh, to, to seek out the Word of God. 
Uh, it is a beautiful time to listen um, for the trumpet to sound, to listen and, and to discard the uncertain sound, but to hang on to the positive sound and to understand that there is a double helix of the tree of good and evil. And, and it has an ancient story of facts that both are good and evil that are infused into creation. And to protect the deeper holy issues from being entwined with infold of such an infusion of good and evil, distinctions of good have to be separated uh, by levels of deepness and by acuteness of visibility by the Holy Spirit. So, as Paul said, if the, if the gospel is hid, it's hid from them who are lost. For the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. So, we begin to see that the word of God is so wonderful, so powerful, and that without the vision of the word of God, what is left is the perishings. And God wants to give people a new insight and he wants to open up the seals and we have to understand that there are things that that have occurred that are are very very important um we have to understand that there are some things that are sealed job 9 7 says he sealeth up the stars now the stars can have a multiple kind of meaning stars can represent individuals Stars can represent uh, uh, suns. Uh, stars can represent planets. And, and um, then they can represent, uh, you know, uh, particular uh, uh, descriptive companies of stars, like the seven stars and the seven thunders. And, and uh, then there are, uh, in uh, Job 33, 14 through 16, uh, dreams that can open up the, the ear. Uh, and, and, and can open up instruction that have been sealed. And it takes a gift of the Holy Spirit to open up those, those uh, sealed uh, uh, messages. Uh, in Job 37, 7, it says, He sealeth up the hand of every man. This revelation of the hand includes apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. It includes all kinds of beyond that, like there's the right hand and the left hand of God, and, and it includes ministry. And th those things have been sealed. They have to be opened. So we're talking about the unsealing that God wants to do in this day and in this time. And Jude 14 talks about the ancient Enoch prophecy uh, about the Arturians. The Deuteronomy 33 talks, uh, talks about it. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 2. And Psalms 68, 17 through 18 talks about the, the Arturians connected with Job 38. And that which was, which is, and which is to come is all part of those things that God wants to unseal and to reveal. Uh, seal is an ancient and invisible truth sealed and only made known by the Holy Ghost. John 14 through 26, the Holy Ghost teach us and brings all things to remembrance. And, and uh, he, he sealeth the hand of every man that has to do about each person's birthright. John 1, 9, the light of the kingdom of God is born in every person. I mentioned that earlier. That's in John 1, 9. And uh, energy dots, you could find that message in Psalms 19 and Romans 10. It's, it's just interesting, it's exciting, it's, it's beautiful. So there are things of revelation you must know to understand the Bible. You know, uh, Ephesians 6, 12 talks about powers and principalities. Roman, uh, Revelation 17, 10 through 16 talks about a river of time, mountains and kings and waters and people. And, and, uh, and uh, Proverbs uh, <clears throat> uh, 36, 16 um, talks about the 70,000 generations. And, and uh, Psalms 90 and Psalms 105 talks about average lifespans and covenants of, of thousands of generations. And, and uh, it just goes on and on. And these are things you need to know. Uh, Daniel 8, 9 and 11 and 
20 and 21 talks about the abomination of desolation. Uh, the four beasts and the 24 elders are talked about in Revelations 5, 8 through 9. There is so much that needs to be brought into the reality. Daniel misfigured time. Daniel 9, 2 uh, shows that Daniel understood time by the books, but found out that the books were not right. And, and that the 70 weeks uh, uh, represent 70,000 generations uh, had to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. So there is so, so much. Okay, now, as promised in Facebook, I want to go to a very challenging and uh, interesting subject uh, <laughs> you will be uh, <clears throat> amazed at. We're going to turn to the book of Judges. And I want to talk about this thing that keeps coming up that has to do with what's called the Planet X. Planet X7, they say it is the uh, planet that is number nine now. You've got all the planets of the solar plexus, and there is this planet uh, called uh, number nine. So anyway, uh, we, we have to uh, get into that and understand what it is saying, because if we don't, there is no way that we can know what, what the fact is. And, and uh, when we get into these things, uh, we, we just get uh, taught deeply on what God is trying to say. So uh, when we talk about the solar system, uh, we're going to be talking about these planets. Uh, and and uh, there is a parallel to the solar system and the solar plexus. And uh, the, the solar plexus lies behind the stomach of the human being, but it is the nervous system and it's connected to the heart and the whole body. Yeah, well, the solar system's connected to the sun, which is the body, the chief body, and and it, in a sense, is sort of like the nerves of of the solar of the of the body. <coughs> well, what about this planet X that people keep you know keep talking about? Well, all right, let's let's <laughs> let's open this up. Let's let's get it straight. It is uh, it's ridiculous. For, uh, uh, for, for people to not, not have the truth about this because there is just so much makeup, you know. The Bible says, you know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And uh, this lack of knowledge is what is causing lots and lots of problems. This idea about there being other planets beyond Pluto um, you know, uh, actually, it's not new. It goes back uh, to the 1840s uh, when an a, a astronomer, uh, you know, noticed that some of the um, astro asteroids uh, were perturbed and, and Uranus, another planet, was perturbed and that the idea was there had to be something out there uh, that was uh, causing that uh, perturbation. And so they came up, you know, that there must be be maybe some other planet uh, that we haven't discovered. Um, in uh, 1894, uh, a fellow by the name of Lowell, um, uh, you know, did a lot of study on it, and he discovered uh, by 1916 uh, that um, it basically was that the that the whole mathematical uh, a classification uh, to the planet Neptune as far as its position and as far as uh, many things that, that had to do with the indication of its, um, its uh, orbit and, and, uh, and its gravity effect had been misfigured. And so when they refigured that whole thing on Neptune, then the idea of planet X went away for a long, long time because that solved that solution. So this thing is, you know, is, is not new. Now there's some other little trinklings that are going around, and uh, their people are coming up with this, this thing again. Uh, there's people, hundreds and hundreds, I guess maybe, maybe even thousands, maybe a thousand or more people, that claim that they have taken a picture of this, uh, this planet. And that's just a bunch of baloney. And, and that's because telescopically, 
uh, you know, they don't have the equipment to do that. And what they are actually taking pictures of are more along the line are what are called sun dogs. And that's a little bit like, you know, some of these problems they have even with telescopes called lensing, where you take a picture of something, but that picture is not actually there. It's just a transferred image of something that is someplace else. And that is very, very common in, in, in astronomy. Uh, and that's even with the people that have the right equipment. And then with these people that think they're going out and they're seeing things and they're telling people, oh, yeah, I've got a picture of it. And they've sent a lot of these pictures into astronomers. And astronomers have, have de denied that that has anything of validity at all to do with, this, with, with any kind of a, of a new planet X uh, that people are trying to claim exist. Now, about two to three years ago, there was a fairly well-known uh, uh, evangelist broadcaster. And uh, we had occasion to talk a few times on the telephone. And he was telling me that, you know, that the, the, the end of the uh, time of the earth was coming, the rapture was going to happen, because there's this huge planet that was... Uh, uh, maybe uh, three to 15 times the size uh, of the earth uh, with its mass uh, was going to uh, be coming uh, from uh, the solar system beyond uh, Pluto and, and, and it's making its, uh, its uh, orbital path that only happens like every 10 to 12,000 years and uh, it would be uh, very close to the earth and it would, it would cause incredible destruction to the earth and and that that's what's going to happen in just just a few months and so i said to him that is not going to happen in a few months that is absolutely a false notion and it's not going to happen and 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 i'm going to tell you right now that we're going to pass through this year and it's not going to happen and that is false and he said oh no 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 you are wrong i said no i'm not i said i'll tell you what if that happens this year, I will come and join your church. If you will promise me that if it doesn't happen, you will come and follow the manifest teachings. And he says, well, um, I might do that, he says, but I says, I, I might just decide that if this doesn't happen, I might just commit suicide. Because he says, I believe that it's going to happen. I said, you would commit suicide? Oh, come on. You're revealing a, a, an incredible weak side about yourself. I am amazed. So I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, just this March that has passed, <clears throat> a person that had a huge following and has some astronomy background predicted that in March of this year that the Planet X would arrive in close to our area and would have vast effects on the earth. So what are they saying are the signs of it? They are saying that the, the escape of methane gas from the different layers of the earth and it's coming out, uh, you know, above into the, in, into the airways and the sky, uh, the increase of earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, uh, the effect of the magnetic field, and the excessive lightning that is happening and is going to increase, all these things are supposed to increase, is directly because of the approach of Planet X. And I tell you now, that has failed. And they say, well, maybe it'll happen in April. I tell you now, it will not happen in April. And that the reason we're having these things, scientifically speaking, is because of the overheating of the Earth. That is why the methane gas is escaping. That is why of the increased earthquakes. That is why of, of increased volcanic activity, uh, effect of the magnetic field, the excessive lightning. And also the increase of, of uh, some diseases that haven't been around. That's all got to do with the overheating of the earth. Now, I noted that this astronomer that made this false prediction was quoting Revelations chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. 
about the woman that's, you know, standing in the clothed with the sun and the dragon and trying to make that as though that was the scripture supporting this planet X. And that is the biggest ball of bunk that has ever been tossed to trying to get it over the net. That is a lead ball of junk that, that will never fly. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, it goes back to people trying to connect it with uh, this gentleman who wrote a lot of little small books, supposed to be an interpreter of religion, uh, and he called it about this planet Nebiru that was going to come and, and, and that it ever so often uh, would show up. And they would call and say, yeah, that's it, that's that Nebiru, that's, that's the same thing as the planet X. And, and uh, I, I, I want you to know, uh, when they they try to prove it by saying, well, they're, uh, you know, people the, the people know in the knowledge know this is going to happen. That's why they built all the overground uh, the underground cities. That is not why they built the underground cities. That is not why they built the seed the seed vault in Switzerland, where they're storing all the seeds. Those underground cities, some of which go miles under the earth. We've preached about it. We've taught about it. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with survival uh, and uh, against wars and against uh, uh, environment and, and has nothing to do with the planet 7X. And that's a lot of bunk. And if you are into believing that, may God have mercy on you. May God have mercy on you because that is a 100% wrong idea. Now, am I saying that there does not exist any other kind of planet beyond Neptune? Uh, why do they call it the ninth planet instead of the tenth? Because Pluto is no longer considered a planet. It's considered a dwarf planet that does not count as a regular planet. So now, <clears throat> so now um, Neptune is, is eight, the eighth planet, and any new planet would be number nine. And that's the reason for that idea. So I want you to listen to me. I, I'm going to I'm going to share with you some things that you'll find this, you know, uh, interesting. Uh, there are all kinds of undiscovered. Uh, you know, uh, Paul went to Athens, and here was a an inscription to the unknown God, because there are a lot of things that are not known. Turn with me to the book of Judges, and um, and here we find. In Judges, them still talking about things from the books of Moses. Uh, let's look at chapter 5, verse 4. Lord, when thou wentest out of Sire, when thou marched out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, and the clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord. Even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Now, that's either very spectacular super adjectives just put in a po po uh, prophetic form or there is something that really happened there that it either happened on a symbolic scale but it was about something that was going to happen on a major scale because we know that, for instance, in Isaiah, it talks about the earth being turned upside down. And we know that this could represent a, a shift within the earth. So we know there are things coming. Well, when it says here, uh, it, it's, it's talking in the language of, of Moses. When thou wentest out of, out of Seir, uh, S-E-I-R, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom. Now, I want you to get this. Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That is the, the tetragrammaton, the four letters. That means Yahweh El or Yahweh. When thou wentest out of Sire, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the Lord goes out of this place called Seir. He marches out of the field of Edom and you think of armies of the Lord are with him. And he's having an effect not only on what the earth is, but he's having an effect. I'm going to show you that the Bible teaches all the way to the, the solar plexus. 
or the solar system, if you want to totally disconnect it from the plexus within your body, and when, now get this, when this happens, the earth trembles. Now this isn't a piece of ground like an earthquake. We're just in the area of Sinai. There's an earthquake there. Just in the area of Sila, there's an earthquake there. This is talking about the E-R, E-A-R-T-H, earth trembles. It shakes. The whole earth shakes. Something big time is being talked about here. And the heavens dropped. Now, when you think about the heavens dropped, that means that something potentially in the heavens moves out of that orbit, wherever it is, and comes down toward the earth and causes the earth to tremble, the whole earth to tremble. Something is talked about here. Now, unfortunate for these people that have tried to use Revelations 12.1, which is so ridiculous because of the meaning of what that really has. This scripture would have been a whole lot better one. And you'll see when I'm finished. Now, when Moses and Joshua went over into these areas by Kadesh and over in these areas where the Moabites and the Amorites were, things were happening. Mountains were melting. Not mountain, but mountains melting. Some of those mountains were rock. They melted. What's going on? From before the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps. Even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Now, what kind of time was it? What kind of, well, it was a time that it was not easy for, uh, for people to go and get on a road and take it to some places. They had to go in caravans to protect themselves from the different kinds of thieves and their little private armies that they used to rob people. So it says in verse 6, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through the byways. That's how difficult it was to go on a regular highway because there were these two groups that robbed people. That was the times. Now then, in verse 7, interestingly, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Boy, this is a Mother's Day thing. Deborah, a mother in Israel. But guess what was going on? They chose new gods. Then war was at the gates. Now you have to understand that this is all in connection these new gods to Nimrod. Nimrod, who was the father builder of Babel, Babylon, in the land of Shinar, where when the captive Israelites were taken there, they tried to, to create and there to be in Shinar another sort of temple place to worship God, but it didn't work out. It wasn't part of the plan. And it is so important so very, very important to get this whole picture because these gods that it's mentioning, not all of them, some were gods that, like Moloch that was for sacrificing your children, walking them through the fire and all kinds of things. But some of the gods, and I've ministered on this in the past, were gods about other planets like Saturn and Mars and, and other planets that existed. And how that the giants were actually taken to Mars and then to into a, a, a one of the the satellite planets of 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 Saturn, and how that then they were brought back and they were called the sons of the Anakims, mentioned in Deuteronomy one twenty eight, which were the same particular giants that Moses was said 
it will be your job to go and to destroy all the seed of these giants because they are the remnant of the giants during the flood that were supposed to be destroyed by the flood but were not destroyed, obviously, because they were taken away by Lucifer using the claim of the same right that the when Jesus said that as in the days of Noah, there was a rapture and people were taken up. There's going to be another rapture, he says, coming. And because of that rapture that was allowed, then Lucifer was allowed to have a rapture for his, his giants, his anachimes, anachims. Now, the Bible says in this Deuteronomy 1, 28, the Bible says there was walls made in the cities of these Anakim in which they were walled up to heaven. Now, some people think, oh, that just meant they were went up into the sky. No, it's much deeper than that. Much, much deeper. And it's the same idea that when, when, when Nimrod built this tower and he built it to reach into the heavens, there was a communication thing. And that's what this thing in Deuteronomy 128 was about also. A, a form of, and I, I've, I've given some uh, uh, direction on that in my teaching about the, the E, uh, the E revelation. But uh, we don't have time for that right now. And so we see with this a connection with these, to Moses' revelation, experience of happenings which was a revealing of things far out into space and time. Now, how do you really get into the connection of it? Well, just in this same chapter, chapter 5 of Judges. Let's go and let's look into it a little closer in verse 20. And we're going to be a while with this yet, but in verse 20 it says, And they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Syria, Sisera. They fought from heaven. The stars, now in this case, stars were, were, was a name for planets as well as for suns and as well as for people. So now, let's look of a future time that is predicted here, of some massive thing that's going to happen from outer space and going to cause the earth to tremble. And there's going to be a Star Wars, which in this case is really a war of the planets. And who will be the people of this war of the planets? Humans. Look at all the incredible wars that have happened on earth. Massive millions of people. They were all humans fighting humans, brothers fighting brothers, relatives fighting relatives, Foreigners fighting f foreigners. So now we have the message. And they fought from heaven, the stars in their courses. The courses have to do with orbits. The courses have to do with times. It won't be too long. Within a hundred years or less, people will be living. There will be cities on Mars. And they'll spread out from Mars because by then they'll have learned terraforming. And they'll begin to terraform other planets. Before you know it, many of the satellites of these big giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn will have life. And there'll be cities and there'll be armies. And there'll be the wars of the planets. And might there be another planet with the idea of planet 9 or and planet 10 and planet 11, 12, it's totally possible. I will not say that there is not. I will say that these things are just the fact when, Moses, when Paul went to that, to that, that mount in Mars at Athens, and he read to the unknown God. All of these things are circumcised by the Spirit. 
so that you don't get the 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 fubble. But in the world out there that does not know the reality, they get the junk along with all the truth. And so this is the incredibility. This is the awesomeness. And I'd like to go on and I'd like to tell you about Gideon and how that God sent angels to, to war and set the people free. But I think we're going to have to save that. And I think that I so wanted to get into this teaching about the Spirit today, but I just run out of time. And we'll have to, we'll have to do this Spirit expansion and teaching next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you and Janet Lee at the organ.